So you're caring for a patient with flu-like illness. You've ruled out other viral pneumonias, this in spite of knowing the high co-infection rates. You've been on hold with infection control for 40 minutes, gotten your angry and frightened patient to agree to their third swab attempt of the day, stuck it all in the plastic baggie in the scariest biohazard fridge in the hospital, and you send the sample to your lab. And now what? My name is Byron Liu, and I'm an academic hospitalist in New Jersey. Admit it. Many of us in internal medicine depend on a yes-no result, having long forgotten the specifics of how tests are actually run. But this might be a good time to refresh ourselves on the long-forgotten no-man's land of PCR testing. So let's do it. Most sanctioned COVID-19 testing currently done in the U.S. is based on the real-time PCR or RT-PCR process. So the lab gets the nasopharyngeal swab, but it ends up being a mishmash of majority human parts and potentially scant amounts of viral parts. First, everything is digested down even further, resulting in a finer mishmash. What we're looking for at the end of the day is viral RNA. But to do this, we have to change all the RNA in that chunky sample to complementary DNA. So we add some random primers and reverse transcriptase in all existing RNA, the RNA from virus, the mRNA from human cells, the mRNA from rando bacteria, all of it is converted to complementary or cDNA. So now we've got the soup of DNA representing random genes of the patient, the coronavirus, whatever else is living in the nose, but we're looking for pieces unique to coronavirus. And to find these little pieces in the soup, we're going to add a real crack team of characters to this mix. First is TAC polymerase. This is a DNA polymerase that is extremely heat stable because it's native to deep sea extremophile bacteria. And like its habitat, it is extreme. Unlike the enzymes of our own feeble human bodies, which work best at 37 degrees, this enzyme is most active at higher temperatures. Its maximal activity occurs at around 75 degrees Celsius. And it copies DNA like any polymerase. But importantly, it also chops up pre-existing DNA in its path like a deep sea train wielding an ax. But it, like most polymerases, requires a primer to start working. Then we get our second team member, the primer. This primer is the most engineered part of this diagnostic system because it is designed to be specific to a unique piece of coronavirus genetic material, which differentiates it from all the other viral chunks in the DNA library. It starts annealing, or sticking, to DNA that it matches at around 60 degrees Celsius. In reality, there are two primers at the beginning and end of the area we're looking for, but I'm leaving it out for graphical simplicity. Our third team member is a probe composed of a fluorescent molecule attached to DNA. In actuality, the probe consists of a fluorescent part and a quote-unquote quenching part, but I'll keep it simple and say that the probe lights up when its associated DNA gets chopped into little pieces. And the last things added are just random nucleotides, and that's everyone. Okay, so you take all these things and stick them together and heat the whole thing to 60 degrees. Remember, the specific primer anneals at 60 degrees to the sequence we're interested in. The TAC polymerase, as you remember, isn't super active at 60 degrees. 60 degrees is not extreme enough. But having set the stage, let's make things extreme by heating this up to around 75 degrees. TAC wakes up and starts to furiously build on wherever there's a primer for it to land on. And it chops the primer out of the way and goes down the line replicating only coronavirus cDNA using nucleotides floating around. At some point, it comes upon the probe, and as you may have guessed, probe gets the chop. The degradation of the probe causes a release of light. But on the human scale, that light is really faint and not nearly enough to be useful. So at this point, we actually turn the whole thing up to 90 degrees to get the DNA to denature from itself. After this, we turn the whole thing down to 60 degrees again, TAC goes inactive, the primers can anneal again. We've been here before, but wait, now there's twice as much coronavirus DNA present. So the circulating primers will anneal to any existing DNA. And as we turn the temperature up to 75 degrees again, that whole business of TAC running down the tracks, knocking the probes off and causing fluorescence happens again, but just twice as much. You know what's more extreme than doing something once or twice? Doing it again and again and again and again. <laughs> And again. So we've done this now like 40 times. Each cycle that we do this, we cause twice as many blips of light as the last time. And so our little optical receptor can pick up this exponentially increasing degree of light release. 
Let's pause. If you think about the math of it and take it back to the beginning of the process, the sooner the light curve develops, the more coronavirus RNA was present at the very beginning of this process. So if the light shows up earlier than a certain cutoff, it would be considered a positive test. This system is not perfect. TAC can eventually come to amplify random pieces of DNA, which is why positive and negative control specimens to calibrate this curve are super important. The other issue here is one of time. This process of heating something to 90 degrees and cooling it to 60 degrees over and over and over again used to be done by hand. Nowadays, it's done by a machine called a thermocycler, but doing this 40 plus times still takes about two and a half hours. The extraction and reverse transcription steps take about two and a half hours too. This combined with transport and processing means it can take an awful long time in the context of an active pandemic. At this point, fast and accurate testing is key, and I hope that novel strategies yield practical results. Safid recently received approval for their gene expert test, a form of RT-PCR that only takes 45 minutes to run. I have no idea how it goes so fast. Scientists are working on potentially even faster techniques. One lab at the Broad Institute at MIT is attempting to take advantage of a modified version of the CRISPR system to speed up testing to something on the order of 30 minutes, done outside of a central lab without a thermocycler. Okay, so once again, I'm floored by quote-unquote basic research suddenly leaping to practical life in times of crisis. Let's not forget that TAC polymerase was literally discovered at the bottom of the sea, or that reverse transcription is the mechanistic crux of HIV, the virus behind a previous mysterious pandemic. Special thanks to Dr. Dejan Nikolic, Director of the Microbiology Lab at Cooper University Hospital. As always, if you have any suggestions for other topics to cover, leave them in the comments below and hit like and subscribe also. We'll see you next time. This has been a production of I Am Sketchpad.